Happy New Year, everyone. Nikki here, and I am thrilled to be back with you on iWizard after a nearly six month long hiatus in which Jordan and I purchased and moved into our new home. So we're all settled in, we had our holidays together, and if you're interested in checking out our library, take a look at Jordan's bookshelf tour video. And it goes without saying that Buying your first home is pretty stressful, so I did not get a lot of reading done, unfortunately. But what helped get me through it was Neil Gaiman's Memoirs. published in 1996, and it was Neil Gaiman's first solo novel, and the conception of Neverwhere was quite unique in that it was originally created as a BBC TV series, and it was co-created with Lenny Henry. And Lenny Henry, he's done a lot, he's a comedian, he's an actor, he's a writer, he's an academic, but you might recognize him from Rings of Power. So this was really a companion novelization. So Neverwhere came out about three episodes into the TV series. This is a novelization of the movie Precious based on the book Push by Sapphire. Richard Mayhew is our protagonist and he's Scottish and he's a weavy haired boyish young man who had a rumpled just woken up look to him, which made him more attractive to the opposite sex than he would ever understand or believe. Uh, yeah, here's our <laughs> 1996 picture of Neil Gaiman. I wonder who he was modeled off of. Anyway, <laughs> I am guilty of this phenomenon as well. Here's a vintage picture of Jordan. So the prologue begins with Richard out at a Scottish pub with his friends, and he is celebrating because he has just landed his adulty job in London. And so his life is gonna begin, excitement awaits, but of course, it's just like your typical nine to five job. His life is very not exciting. He has a solid group of friends. He has a fiance named Jess, oh, sorry, Jessica. And she is a perfectionist to say the least. She reminded me a little bit of Hermione Granger and she's always giving Richard a hard time because she wants him to live up to her standards. And then after a particularly stressful day at work, Richard has to go out to dinner with Jessica and her boss and they're running late. And so as they're hurrying to dinner, this redheaded pixie like girl with too many grimy layers of lace and velvet clothing just pops out of a door in the wall, a door that was not even supposed to be there at all. So she literally comes from nowhere and she's also covered in blood and she collapses on the sidewalk in front of Richard and Jessica. And the thing is, Richard decides to help her. And the girl's name we find out later on is Dor. And as Dor says later on, you've a good heart. Sometimes that's enough to see you safe wherever you go, but mostly it's not. So opting to help Dor in that moment is the end of Richard and Jessica, and really it's the end of life as he knows it. So she leads him down the rabbit hole, or really in this case, more like the sewer grate into the London below. And it's like this nonsensical world. And Neil Gaiman did, an, excellent job of making you feel really frustrated for Richard. So everything he has spent his entire life working for just up and vanishes. And he is feeling utterly helpless. You're feeling helpless for him. And you just want him more than anything to get his life back. I love the characters in this novel. They're imaginative, but somehow still relatable. And the reason I think they're still relatable is that they're full of heart. Well, at least those within the hunting group of companions are, and they're just so memorable. All the characters stick with you. Aside from Richard, the other major character is the Lady Door. 
And Dor is from a noble family, and they have this special ability of creating portals. So they're known as openers, and their surname reflects this. Their surname is Portico. Their first names also reflect this. So Dor's mother is Portia, her brother is Ark, and her sister is Ingress. And her father is only referred to as Lord Portico. Uh, and they live in the House Without Doors. And the House Without Doors is a fascinating idea. Her grandfather created this house by collecting rooms from various points in space and time. And so there are no doors between the rooms. So only the family can travel in that house because they're openers and they can create their own doors. So some of Gaiman's other vivid characters are two of the villains. Those are Krupp and Vandemar, they're hitmen, hired to take out the Portico family. So they're after Dor. Uh, when she is, she, she, they're the reason she's covered in blood when Richard finds her on the street. And Krupp and Vandemar really reminded me a lot of Kruger and Dark from Something Wicked This Way Comes. So I'm wondering if maybe there was some inspiration there from that. Next is the Marquis de Carabas. He's a uh, part of the hunting group of companions. He's a lot of fun. He's a dandy. He's a bit extra. He's always entertaining and energetic. But he begs the question, what are his motives? Because you get the sense that he's really out for himself and can you trust him? But you do get the sense that he does care about things. Like his friend, Old Bailey, maybe. Old Bailey is quite eccentric. He lives on rooftops in the London below and he uh, tends to his birds. He's also covered in feathers. He's super strange. And along with Richard and Dor and the Marquise de Carabas, uh, another member of their hunting group of companions is Hunter. And she's kind of like um, Brienne of Tarth. She's big, a bodyguard. She's the greatest fighter in the London below. And her goal is to kill the great beast of London. Lastly, in good old Neil Gaiman fashion, we have an angel, the angel Islington, who accidentally drowned the city of Atlantis. There are quite a few connections in Neverwhere, and Neverwhere is essentially a much darker, grittier Alice in Wonderland, combined with some elements from Wizard of Oz, in that Richard has to visit a great and powerful entity uh, so he can return home because that's all he wants. He wants to get back to his life in the London above. And if I had to give a certain feel to Neverwhere, it's like if you took an old, dirty subway car and converted it into a greasy diner that served the Mad Hatter's tea. Neverwhere is a work of magical realism with a touch of surrealism, but that part is never over the top. I never felt lost in this book or alienated in this book. I was just always gripped and fascinated. So some of the more unique elements uh, included uh, the rat speakers. So those people who communicate with rats, uh, there were floating markets underground uh, and they had some connection to London above, that you, but you would never see them in London above. And then uh, time and history were somehow a tube destination. Okay, so you had like these little pockets of historical old London in the underground. Like you'd get like wafts of old London's pollution. Super strange, but also fascinating. There's an, an elements of mythology as you usually get in Neil Gaiman's works. And also when I was reading this, I got some serious, Starless Sea vibes. Uh, so I'm thinking that Erin Morgenstern probably got some inspiration from Neverwhere in her Starless Sea, in which doors and keys are very important as well. Neverwhere is also a labyrinthian tale complete with a beast. And the beast is not quite a minotaur, and it's also not one of Gaiman's famous bisons, but it is a boar. And if you're interested in learning a little bit more about another labyrinthian tale that I reviewed, check out Tim Powers' alternate roots. And 
Seriously, I feel like I need to read some more Tim Powers because I learn so much from him. And here's another thing that I learned from Tim Powers that I recognized in Neverwhere. And Neil Gaiman came up with these characters or this race. I'm not too sure what they are, but they're known as the Velvets. And the Velvets are beguiling women who are essentially vampires. And they feed on the breath of life from people rather than blood. And the most important Velvet to never wear is Lamia. And Lamia is a Greek demigod, but also there's a Keats poem called Lamia. And that's the connection I got from Powers. I feel like he teaches me so much. Uh, and I read an excerpt from Lamia at the start of my Stress of Her Regard review. But essentially in that poem, a young man falls in love with a serpent who is, who is disguised as a woman. Never wear as a building's Roman. So it's a coming of age tale. Even though Richard isn't that young in it, he's in his mid twenties or early thirties. Uh, he does at times during this act extremely immature, like an absolute child, uh, which is one of the, his little frustrating traits, but he does, he, he does grow quite a bit from start to end in this book. And he goes from living this passive existence in which she's just always reacting to living a life in which she's taking action and taking responsibility for himself and for others. And it's an, another major theme in this is the importance of confidence and believing in yourself and appreciating what you have and knowing importantly what you ultimately want not what and doing what you want not what others expect you to do so this is probably a really good thing for people to read now as you make new year's resolutions and if you want some inspiration about growth and really taking responsibility for yourself now might be a good time to pick up neverwhere and I love Neil Gaiman. I love Neverwhere. I love most, I've loved every book I've read of his. I loved Sandman. So if you haven't read Neverwhere, pick it up, give it, give it a read. And the thing is, I've had an exhausting past few months and I read this way more slowly than I would have in any other, at any other time in my life. I read it in short bursts right before bed. And you know, that's not really the way that you should read books. So I'm sure I will give this a reread at some point and I will get a lot more out of it during that time. So how do I rate Neverwhere? Okay, so story, I rated a nine. It is a satisfying read and Neil Gaiman sticks the landing. Like, I think the ending is absolutely perfect and it ties everything together, even like elements of the prologue beautifully. And so there might have been maybe a, a little too much travel or exploration around the middle area of the book, but that's really hard for me to say because I read this just way too slowly. Not the book's fault, my fault. Read it too slowly, so I don't have a good sense of the pacing. Okay, so for characters, I rated them an eight and a half. So while the characters were just totally vivid and memorable, they were a little far away from my liking. So you get this semi-omniscient point of view in which Gaiman like dips into each character in various passages, like rather than like devoting like a whole chapter to a single POV. So he'll go a little bit into Richard's head, then he'll go into Dora's head, then he'll go into the Marquise's head, and then he'll like come up and give you this like big sweeping view of what's going on. And he does it really well because a lot of times I get distracted by that. He does do it well, uh, but that's why they got an eight and a half. So pros, I'd say um, a nine. Uh, this is Gaiman's first book on his own. Uh, I thought the writing was great. It's cheeky, uh, light, but thoughtful and always illustrative and evocative. I always have so much fun reading his writing. I love his style of writing and originality. Originality, I rated this a 9.5. And as far as I can tell, this is just, it's super original, even though it does pull influences from history, from mythology, from other literature. But 
it's done in such a creative way and he weaves it together so seamlessly that you're really never questioning it. And so I love this like whole concoction of the London below. And if you want more of this, there's talk that maybe there's gonna be another book called The Seven Sisters coming out maybe eventually. There's a novella about the Marquise that is out. I have not read that yet. And then lastly is world building. And I gave this a 10 on world building because it's phenomenal how much world building he did in a 370 page book. And maybe the uh, inner workings of the characters did suffer slightly from that, but the story did not suffer. And so overall, this was 9.2. So I'd say five stars. And um, I just keep loving everything I read from Neil Gaiman and would love to just keep reading more. So thank you so much for joining me for my review of Neverwhere. What's coming up? Well, I'm not doing any big TBR probably ever again with after what happened this summer. We promised like a kajillion books and then like life just went kablooey out of control. So anyway, I am about halfway through Tiamat's Wrath. And so very soon you'll have ex a re review for Expanse number eight. And then I'm going to completely finish up the whole series and maybe do a reflection on the series. I will return to Cold Fire very soon. I'm almost done with When True Night Falls, but I think I'm going to hold off on doing a review until I finish the whole trilogy so I can talk to you about Cold Fire as a whole. And otherwise, to keep up with iWizard, please subscribe to this channel, check out our Goodreads, our Patreon, and I will see you very soon. Bye!